Good day and welcome to JCC Sunday Schools in Session, where Sunday School matters to God. Please like, comment, and subscribe to our channel. We'd love to have you as a part of the JCC family. Our lesson is titled, Obedience and Justice, and it's coming from Exodus, the 23rd chapter, verses 1 through 9. The first five books of the Bible are called the books of the law. The law reveals God's demands for justice as well as his compassion for his people. One of the functions of the law was to preserve society, injustice, and fairness for all citizens. This week's lesson examines Exodus 23, verses 1 through 9, and is an expansion of the ninth commandment, forbidding false witness. Let's get into the lesson and see what it has to offer us today. Verse 1 reads, Thou shalt not raise. Now let me pause right there for a second. The word raise here means to publicize or make public. Do not make public a false report. Basically, this verse is telling us that we do not lie. Don't put our mouth to a lie. Anything that is false, we should not put our mouth to it. We're not to make a a testimony of anything that is false. We're not to lie or make things up that are untrue. This is why we must be careful and not to gossip or be a gossiper. Generally, it tells us not to lie or stretch the truth. And we see here in this verse, we're to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help us God. He says, Thou shalt not raise a false report, or put not thine hand with a wicked to be an unrighteous witness. Now, to put your hand to something means do not associate with people who are wicked. Wickedness is defined as one who has a disregard for justice, righteousness, truth, and honor. It's a person who does evil with a purpose. They do it with the intent to sin. Those who like to bring harm, hurt, or doing terrible things to others just as a sin. These people are wicked. And what does light have to do with darkness? Nothing. So we learn not to associate with wicked people who want to bring about wickedness on other people. Question one says, what harm can result from yielding to peer pressure following the views of the majority. In our present text, following the crowd is especially bad because it hurts the innocent. In addition, in preventing justice, it dishonors the name of our righteous God. Those who allow the crowd to shape their opinions and their actions are always susceptible to this evil. See, the point is, whether in a courtroom or in everyday life, We must always speak the truth at all costs. God is showing us he expects his people to be on the side of justice and not on the side of those who bear a false report to get ahead. Verse 2 reads, And thou shalt not follow a multitude to do evil. This is saying do not go after the majority. Some of the biblical examples that we can see about following the masses, one was Reuben in giving his brothers to sell Joseph He followed the crowd of his brothers. The second is the Israelites worshiping the golden calf. The way the Bible reads it, everybody did it. Third, the crowd who praised Christ entry into the city and shouted for his death is another time where we can see how people followed the crowd. And another is time is when Peter ate with the Gentiles. And when the Jews came to his side, he ate with the Jews and neglected the Gentiles. And Paul had to call him out on it. See, We are the minority as children of God, not the majority. And the majority of this world will do evil. The word says, wide is the road that leads to the destruction. And it's full of people. But narrow is the road that leads to eternal life. And every now and then we'll find a traveler. This is telling us that righteousness will be in the minority. We are to be different and the world will not want us and be against us. We are to be like Caleb and Joshua or maybe Daniel and Noah, or even David, they all were on God's side and refused to go along with the crowd. We're not to go along to get along. That's the rule that we need to follow. We cannot do what everyone else is doing because if everybody's doing it, it don't make it right. We can cross-reference this with 1 Corinthians 15, verse 33 and 34, where it speaks of bad company corrupts godly morales. The second half of our verse says, Neither shalt thou speak in a cause to decline after many to rest judgment. This just says, 
Do not speak up for the majority or answer so the majority will get its sinful or unrighteous way. We're called to stand up. And this will mean many times being by ourselves and being different and bearing the testimony of God at all costs. Question two says, how can we resist following the opinions of the crowd? Only those who have developed an inner fortitude and mastered the divine standards to do right can resist the pressures to conform to unjust ways. Verse 3 reads, Neither shall thou continence, meaning tolerate. The continence of a person means that you tolerate something. It says, Neither shall thou continence a poor man in his cause. Question 3 says, Are the poor to be shown favor over the rich? We might sympathize with the poor man who steals food to feed his wife and children, but he's just as guilty of thievery as a wealthy thief. The law must not have a double standard for rich or for poor. God is saying don't side with a poor person just because of their condition. Many times we will look at their situation and have compassion to side with them, but God is saying they may still be wrong or wicked. So if so, then his justice must be carried out. Remember, this chapter is about God's justice. We always side with justice. We see here that in the end, God is going to judge all fairly, whether they are rich or poor. If we did not do what God required, we will be judged accordingly. The teaching point here is the first three verses teach us to do right regardless of what others are doing. We have to work out our own soul salvation with fear and trembling. We see God demands justice. And when his law is broken, we are to ensure we are on the right side of right. See, shading the truth for a popular cause may be tempting, but must be avoided. We must do what is right. Verses 4 and 5 read, If thou meet, that means come in contact with, if thou come in contact with thine enemy's ox or his ass going astray, thou shalt surely bring it back to him again. Watch this right here. This is said, do the right thing and return it. We return the property to the, his rightful owner. Verse 5 says, if thou see the ass of him that hated thee lying under his burden. Let's pause right there. So what has happened here? The donkey cannot get up because of the weight it's carrying on him. And so we should do what is right. We should do what is right. Let's read the rest of the text. And what is forbear to help him? Thou shalt surely help with him. We don't say he would not do it for me. No, again, we do the right thing. We do it to everyone. We do the right thing for everybody. God is saying we are to help the person even if it's our enemy. This shows the New Testament point of loving your enemies in Matthew 5, verse 44. We act in a godly manner regardless of the other person's perspective. We don't walk away and be happy about it. No, we're to help the person with the matter. Remember, we ought to be different and reflect God. Not the sinful nature of the world. We have been called out to be different from the world. Doing this act of kindness may be the very thing that brings one's enemy to the Lord. The world would say for us not to help your enemy, but we have been transformed and we're to do what is right in the eyes of God. God says, thou shalt surely help one in need, even if it's your enemy. Question four says, what is God's method of dealing with enemies? But this is not God's way of dealing with enemies. He sets an example for us by sending his blessing on the just and the unjust alike, as stated again in Matthew 5, 44 and verse 45. And he sent his son to die for us and provide salvation while we were yet sinners. Romans 5 and 8 says, Christ came down to save us. Question 5 says, what good can result from helping an enemy in a hard situation? It would also help diffuse any bad feelings the other man had towards him. His kindness would take away any grounds his enemy may have had for hating him. It sets a precedence that maybe it may turn someone to the Lord because of a kind act. See, the teaching point here is we ought to love our neighbor through our actions. The point to this verse is get involved in helping others, even those who are enemies. We are therefore commanded to love our enemies, to 
to live peacefully with them and even to provide for their daily needs. Romans 12, verses 17 to 21. See, lending a helping hand to an enemy may be the last thing we want to do, but we must if we love God. See, the love of God changes our outcome. It changes us from the inside out. And as a result, we do what's right by God. Verse 6 says, thou shalt not rest. Again, stretch out or pervert or prevent. That's what rest means. It says, thou shalt not rest the judgment of thy poor in this cause. God says here, do not overlook justice to be done even to the poor. Do not overlook it or downplay it. Justice must be done and we are to treat people fairly, no matter their status or condition. Question 6 says, why are political officials inclined to sit with the rich? Those who serve as local officials are usually themselves prominent members of the community. So it's easy for them to identify with others of the same social class and take their side in court. But we see here that's wrong. We're not to take the side of no one because we think we identify with them better. No, we should have show justice just like God commands. Verse 7 says, keep thee far from a false matter. Again, God is saying, don't associate, don't be involved, don't participate with a false matter, knowing this is something for the ages. Basically, God is saying we need to think before we act. Ask ourselves a question. Will this matter bring about negativity on me and my walk with God? Will this conversation, will this action, will this association for the matter cause my character as a Christian to be questioned? That's a question that we should always ask ourselves. Am I doing or what I'm doing? Does it reflect God's nature? It says in verse 7 again, Keep thee far from a false matter, and the innocent and righteous slay thou not, for I will not justify the wicked. Notice this portion of the text. God says, Do not kill anyone who's innocent or righteous. Now, this is looking at this physically, but I want you to see this in another way as well. Sometimes what we say with our mouth can be worse than any gun. We can talk about a person in such a way that it destroys their reputation, their credibility, their character, and their status. This scripture is not talking about it here, but I want you to see the significance of killing people with our mouth as the same bearing as killing someone naturally. The point is, if we do associate with evil, then we will not do what that which is evil. The old saying can be, Guilty by association. We never want to be guilty by our associations. Question 7 asks, Was oppression of the people a problem in Israel? And how do we know? The Lord expressed himself forcefully and repeated concerning his care for the people in Israel. His commands were repeated over and over again for us not to go in and do things in the wrong way. See, the point is, if we get someone in trouble through lies and deceit, we will be in big trouble ourselves with God. God does not want us to go and bear false witness or a false report, nor do he want us to collaborate with someone who's doing things that are wicked. Verse 8 reads, And thou shalt take no gift, meaning no bride. Notice this in the second part of the text, what God says a bride would do. He says, Thou shalt not take no bride, for the gift blinded, the wise, and perverted the words of the righteous. He says that bride's blind and cloud a wise person's perspective. And watch this, the last part, because it happens in the church still today. A bride will distort the words of the words of a righteous person. Allow me to give you an example. If one gives a big donation to the church, but their lifestyle is not right with God, and the leader knows this is a big donor, it may make his delivery of the word that may affect this donor, he may water it down. He may not say it the way it needs to be said. And God is saying that we must be careful, especially as leaders, to not allow a bribe or a gift here to exchange or pervert our righteousness. We must tell it just like God said it. Question 8 says, how will God deal with those who condemn the innocent? The answer is, God judges all things perfectly, and he will not allow the wicked to escape justice. He will hold accountable the real criminals in this case, regardless of the decision of a human tribunal. 
He will also punish the unjust judge who perpetrated the miscarriage of justice. God will deal with everyone who did not do justice in this case. Verse 9 says, And thou shalt not oppress a stranger, for ye know that the heart of a stranger, seeing ye were strangers in the land of Egypt. God is saying, you know the feeling of being an outcast. He said, you know how it feels to be oppressed, to be a stranger and an outcast in a, a land. He said, so don't act the same way others were treating you. The teaching point for verses 7 through 9, they teach us not to have an appearance of evil. We must be careful in what we do and how it will be perceived by others. We don't live for other people, but we do live for God. And he wishes our good not to be evil spoken of. Question nine says, why does scripture so strongly condemn the practice of, of bribery? Bribery is one of the most common forms of political corruption. And scripture gives numerous upon numerous examples of it. Scripture also condemns it repeatedly for it makes a mockery of justice. We never do anything that's going to make a mockery out of God's justice. Question 10 says, what special favors were Israelites to give to resident aliens? Numerous times, Scripture classifies strangers with widows and orphans as those needing special consideration. They were to be treated fairly in court. They were to be cared for in their poverty. They were to have access to the cities of refuge and to be included in the celebration of the festivals. Grain was to be left for them in the corners of the field at harvest time, and they were to be loved. We see God as a, a caring and loving compassion for those who want to be a part of the family. See, the point in these lessons here, bribery and oppression, they have no place among the people of God. We cannot learn to take bribes or learn to take gifts and think that we are obligated to go and then and water down God's word. No, God wants us to stand for justice. No matter what, no matter the situation, we are never to bring about oppression of people who possibly don't meet our social status. No, God wants us to be fair with everybody. He wants us to love everybody. We can see from the, our lesson that God requires justice and he definitely requires compassion. In our interaction with others, we are to be honest with them. We are to avoid showing favoritism. We are to not follow the crowd and do what is right. We are to treat our enemies fairly because this is what God wants us to do. By living in this way, we will stand out in society. When it's easy to go along with the evil, then to stand for justice and truth. Are you willing to stand out from the crowd to do what's right by God? Well, I pray that you enjoyed the lesson. I have. It's been a little different today. I tried something a little bit different. I hope you like it. If you did, please leave me a comment. Let me know what you think. If you have not subscribed, please do so now. It really does help us spread the good news. Well, that's all for this week. Come back next week. Same time, same channel. Be blessed now.